excited about tonight because um, what I'm going to be able to share about tonight is kind of um, exactly along the lines about what Keith has been sharing, but it really started in me back at the Greater Faith Conference back in last February. And Keith has been kind of, what's the word I want to say, poking me, prodding me, uh, nudging me, asking me, saying, you need to share about that in detail. You need to share about that in detail. And so when the Lord, you know, I kind of had a sermon going one way, and the other night I was laying in the bed, and I said, okay, Lord, I really want to do what you want me to do. You know, that's the wise thing, yeah. Yeah. you know. And he dropped that back in my heart, and I remembered exactly the whole thing again, the way it came out. And you know, that's always really good when you get something, if you can just get it clear again exactly the way you got it the first time. And, and I did, and I remembered it, and I took the time, and I wrote it back down again, and, and I looked at it again. But how many of you remember uh, during the Greater Faith Conference that the Lord gave me a word about some things about our equipping and, and things that we would need and things like that? Do you remember that? Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about that in detail tonight. And the title of tonight, I think you're going to like it, is right along the lines Keith has been talking about, but faith for success. You like that? Yeah, I knew you would. I knew you would. So if you would, turn with me in the King James Bible. Now, know this before we start. Most every one of these scriptures you're going to have heard before. But let's see based upon what he told me at the Greater Faith Conference, if you can't get something different out of it, because if you don't ever get anything new out of the Word, then you probably ain't listening. Because the Word is alive. And it's just like every day that you're alive, you, you see something different maybe about your mate, or you see something different about the things that are in the world, you know, or you'll notice something different. Uh, I drove past that place a thousand times and I never saw that. And, you know, and I've, I've been listening to Brother Hagin stuff. And, and like he said the other day, I would know I had to have heard it because I was sitting right there on the second row. So I know I had to have heard it, but I didn't hear it, you know. And so there's always new revelation if you'll just be open to it. So turn with me, if you would, to Proverbs 3, verse 5. This is the King James, and we'll read it real quickly. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. The Amplified says it this way. Lean on, trust in, be confident in the Lord, with all your heart and mind, and do not rely on your own insight or understanding. Why wouldn't you rely on that? We're going to get into that in just a minute. And in verse 6, what's that second word? All. Say it again, everybody. All. All. Now, is that... Some of the things are part of the things, or when you think about it, what does all mean? It means 100%. It means all. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Does that mean when you go to the grocery store? Does that mean when you go to the bank? Does that mean when you go to your mother-in-law's? Does that mean when you go to work? Does that mean when you're just going on a picnic? Well, that's not important. Why do I have to acknowledge the Lord in that? Do you understand what I'm saying? In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And He shall direct your path. Well, maybe you just need to take a different path that day. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct and make straight and plain your paths. He will direct them and make them straight and plain. Now, this is some of the stuff that I want to get into, and I'm just going to dive right in, and then we'll explain it more as we go along. In people's lives, I've seen it a lot, when they're young people or when they're youth, 
they start out in life, and every five-year-old you see, you'll go up to them, or six-year-old, or four-year-old, or seven-year-old, and say, what are you going to be when you grow up? You ever done that? Yes. What do they say? A fireman, a policeman, a doctor, an astronaut, a vet. They all say these things, right? How many of them actually grow up and be those things? Very, very, very few grow up and be those things. Very few. And then even when they get into high school, you ask them, what are you going to do? I'm going to be a, and they name off this, and they name off that, and they name off this, and they name off 15 things. And people throughout their lives go through life picking and choosing what they're going to do and what they're going to be, and so many times that's based upon what? what mom and dad did and the way they raised them or what they want to do. Now, don't get quiet on me. Don't get scared. <laughs> don't get scared. But all kids' lives are like, what did your parents do to you? Just think about yourself. Don't think about your kids. Just think about yourself. Then you won't have any condemnation. What did your parents do to you? Okay? How many of your parents wanted you to go basically into what they were doing? You know? Or See, there's a lot of hands. Or how many of your parents kind of tried to direct you? You want to be a, you know, or you want to be a this. Or they tried to put you in ballet, and you were lousy at ballet. <laughs> Or they tried to put you in piano, and you couldn't hear piano music for nothing. You understand what I'm saying? Or they tried to make you draw, and you couldn't draw nothing. But they tried, because they, they wanted to be that. Or they tried to get you to play sports, you know, and, and you were no good at it. But because they were wanted to be it or something, they, they tried to get you to go down that path. And your heart was not in it. And so for all of a lot of people's lives, they went down paths that were not even really paths that they should have been on to begin with. Because nobody knew how to be led. They weren't doing it in a malicious way. They just didn't know any better. They were doing what light they had. You know? And that's what a lot of people do. They just do the light that they have. And so as being parents, that's what people do. They just do the best they know. But we've got to change the best we know. Amen. And we've got to get better at the best we know. Yes. And so that's what we want to talk about tonight. We don't want to be in the wrong places at the wrong time and ending up with the wrong results. We want to be in the right places at the right times and ending up with the right results. Yes. Can you say amen? Yes. I know. It's, it's frustrating in life to go through your whole life and never have anything that you want. Well, I want us to talk about tonight how to get everything you want. Yes. Everything you want. And there's a way without having to stand for it for 150 years and wait and wait and pray and beg and wait and wait and pray and beg. I am living proof of it. And I can tell you about what I know. I'm living proof of it. And I know how it works, and I don't have to have anybody to prove it to me. I know exactly how to make it work, and I'm going to show you how to make it work. And the proof is in the pudding, as Brother Hagen used to say. Okay? And I've been eating some pudding. Okay? So, um, what you have to look at is each person has different light where the things of God is concerned. So each person is at a different place where the things of God is concerned. But in that different place where God is concerned makes absolutely no difference in their level of their faith. Now let me explain that. You may be believing for a house that cost $150,000. 
okay? You may be believing for a house that costs $250,000. You may be believing for a house that costs $350,000. Everybody's believing for a house, but everybody's at a different level. You may be believing for a, an apartment that costs $250 a month to rent. But do you see what I'm saying? Everybody is starting at a level that they're releasing their faith on to get. And as they go through this faith road or faith life, those levels should be growing in their life. But you should never go through this faith life without having successes to where you're not having to stand forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and never even getting the $250 apartment a month, moving up to the next one and moving up to the next one and moving up to the next one. God never intended it to be that way. That's not what he intended. But there's people all over the place. Every church member has an area that whether yours be healing or whether yours be finances or whether it be your kids or whether it be uh, your job or whatever it is, there's an area that you've been standing in and believing for for longer than you want to. And that's what we need to find out is why that is. So let's look at some more things. Uh, Romans 10, 17. And again, you've heard a lot of these verses, but, but be willing to listen to them differently tonight. Romans 10, 17 says this. It says, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How many of you have ever heard that before? Raise your hand if you've never heard that before. Never in your life heard that before. That's what I thought. Okay, put it up in the Amplified and let's see if you've heard this and got this out of it before. So faith comes by hearing what is told. And what is told comes by the preaching of the message. Stop right there. What is told comes by the preaching of the message. So could you say this? Could you get faith from something that was told you in a message? Yes. Yes. Could you get faith to do something by something that was told you in a message? Yes. Could you get faith to act on something by something that was told you in a message if it was the Word of God? Yes. Yes. So if you read that, faith comes by what is hearing, what is told, and what is heard comes by the preaching of the message, okay? And that comes from the lips of Christ himself. Amen. Okay, so this is where we're going to go. If you hear something in a message, say Keith preached four weeks ago, six weeks ago, okay? five years ago, and you heard something in one of those messages, and you thought, yes, I got that. I need to do that. And you knew it just real plain in your heart, in the service. I need to do that. And you walked out, and you didn't do it. What do you think happens then? Anybody. You what? You miss you miss what though? You missed out on what you what God had planned for you. That's what we're gonna get into. You miss out on things you don't even know about. You miss out on things that you don't even know that you missed out on. And that's exactly what the devil wants. You miss things that you're not even aware of that you missed. You miss blessings that you're not even aware of that you missed. And good things that God had prepared for you that you missed. And that's what the devil doesn't want you to do. Elsewise, why would God have somebody to stand up here and tell you something and quicken your heart and say, Hey! 
hey, hey, red flag, hey, go do this. And you know it in your heart, and it quickens your heart, and you feel it, and you feel quickened about it. Why would he do that to you? Because he wants to take some of your joy from you when you leave church? He wants to take some of your fun out of your life when you leave church? He wants to make your life harder when you leave church? Absolutely not. That's not the God that we serve. If he tells you to do something like that, it's because he has something very, 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 very what? Good, Good planned for you ahead. You're going to understand it more here in just a minute. Okay, guys, if you could put, go ahead and put that out. I know when Keith and I very first got into the ministry, I'm going to read you a sentence that the Lord told me when I was preparing this message. You don't have to know much to follow God's plan. He's meaning much in the word. You just have to want to do what he said. Amen. You don't have to know much of the word or of God. You just have to want to do what he told you to do. Okay, another question. How many of you sitting in here has God ever dealt with something when a service was going on? Raise your hand. Let's just be out. And how many of you avoided doing what he said? <laughs> so we missed out on something. We missed out on something good that the Lord had for us. And that's exactly what the devil wants. I know when Keith and I very first got into the ministry, I mean, it was right away. We started listening to tapes and we started doing all this stuff. But the very first real decision we had to make, it was not easy. But when we went out to go to... The actual decision to go out to the camp meeting at Rama wasn't that big of a deal because we didn't, we had to believe God for the money and we had to do those things. But we were a little bit excited about that. And that's the way the Lord works. I, I truly believe it. Because you're not mature enough to make a decision that would be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Any resistance. Do you understand that? It's like your first decision, you're not strong enough to do anything that has any resistance almost, you know? You, you have to have something that you can just, yes, we're excited about doing this. But then we got out there to Rama, and we took a tour of the campus, and you all heard the story. We got ready to go home, and I looked at Keith, and I said, you ever known you're supposed to do something? and you didn't want to do it? He goes, huh, what? <laughs> and you didn't want to do it. How many of you in here can raise your hand and say, you ever know you're supposed to do something and you didn't want to do it? Now that's where the rubber meets the road. It's the didn't want to do it day. And that's when you have to put your flesh under and do it in spite of the didn't want to do it. Because, now just think with me just for 30 seconds here. What if we didn't do it because I didn't want to do it? There wouldn't be no Faith Life Church number one. There wouldn't be no Faith Life Church number two. There wouldn't be a More Life Ministries. Keith would have never worked with Brother Hagen. We'd have never traveled with Brother Hagen. We'd have never been where we are. We wouldn't know anything about the Word. Do you understand that? We'd be in Podunkville teaching, maybe. We'd have probably quit by now because of the, the Lord's told us a thousand times because of the influences we were around. He had to get us up and get us out and get some Word in us or we would have failed. Because the environment we were in was not conducive to growing. He had to get us up and get us out of there. Now, what if we had decided to stay there? The, the worst part about it is we would not know what we missed. We would 
wouldn't, you wouldn't have a clue. In God's mercy, he doesn't show you that. In his mercy, he doesn't show you all the... We went, and I'm just, I, you know me, I tell you everything, okay? <laughs> the other day, Keith wanted, because, you know, I had gotten him that little truck, yes. right? Yes. That little 1952 Ford truck. So we went by this classic car place the other day, and we were walking through it, and about halfway through it, I looked at him, and I said, Sweetheart, do you know what? We've had almost every car in here. <laughs> I just shook my head because I thought, God, and I just lifted my hands right there in that place because I thought it's just because of God. It is absolutely. When we got married, we had to borrow $2,000 from everybody we could afford it from to get a place to live. And my father-in-law dug a water line to get us a trailer from their water and everybody's water around. And our trailer, the toilet water, froze in the wintertime. And I didn't even have a stove or an oven in this cheap little trailer. I had a toaster oven. And I cooked cornbread on the, on the griddle. I mean, I learned to be a really good cook on a griddle. <laughs> so you, you can't tell me that you can't learn how to make faith cause you to be a success. Amen. Because he got us out of nothing into something. But it was that very first decision when I didn't want to do it that I had to do it in spite of I didn't want to do it. We had to leave everybody and everything and do it anyway. Now, I could stay there and talk about that all night, but you get the point on it, right? Okay. So, um, most people, and I'm going to get to this in just a minute, but I want to cover a couple of things first. Most people, I'm going to tell you some things that the Lord told me to say in this, and then we'll get to that. Most people use up their faith believing for things. Homes and cars and clothes and kids and jewelry and things and healing. That's never been God's intention. It's never been his plan. Rob didn't have a clue what I was going to teach on tonight. He didn't have a clue what color I was going to wear and he wore a purple shirt. But listen to the next verse. Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first. And all these things will be added to you. We're seeking things instead of seeking the kingdom. Instead of seeking God. And don't get quiet on me because you're going to get your answers. I'm telling you. Don't get in fear. Don't get scared. It's the easiest thing you ever done in your life. If it wasn't, this little blonde girl couldn't have done it. Because if it ain't easy, I couldn't have done it. It's easy as doing what God said. You do what he says and you get it. It's just that simple. So Proverbs 13, I mean Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says this. You know it. I can read it to you. They can put it on the board. This is the NIV. Honor the Lord with your substance or wealth and the first fruits of all your increase or crops. What's that next word? Yeah. Only part of you got it. What's the next word? Yeah. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Only then will your barns be filled to overflowing. People are trying to get their barns filled to overflowing before they honor the Lord. You can't get your barns and your, and your pantry filled to overflowing before you do what? Honor the Lord. It doesn't work that way. It's like trying to have a baby before you get pregnant. I mean, I know that's a crude thing, but it doesn't work that way. That's not the way that it works. Or it's trying to get an ear of corn before you plant the seed. 
It doesn't work that way. That's not the way that it works. It's then you will ha your barns will be filled with plenty. Same as Matthew 6, 33. I could read you dozens of stories about this, but you understand the picture. You've got to put God first before you get the result of it. Okay, we'll, we're going to keep going for just a minute. Matthew 7, and this is where we're going to start on the board on the screen. And people aren't going to like some of this, but they'll, they'll, you'll get to the end and you'll really like it. You'll probably even want to dance a little while. <laughs> so I hope you wore your dancing shoes or you could take your shoes off. Matthew 7 in the King James. Enter at the straight gate. Now, as I was planning this, I thought, Lord, it just popped in my heart about that very same thing. It was like that very first time that you've got to make the decision that we were talking about a few minutes ago. Have you ever known you were supposed to do something and you didn't want to do it? That's a pretty straight gate. It's a pretty straight gate when you've got to leave everything you know and do this. It's basically turning your back on everything you knew, everybody you knew, the world you knew, people you knew, and turn it to this way. That's a whole different direction. It's a, it's a different... You've got to go through a different gate. And it's straight as can be. Because if you go to the left, you're not doing what God told you to do. If you go to the right, you're not going where God told you to go. Say, for instance, us. He told us specifically to go to Ramah. What if we'd have said, well, that's a good Bible school, but we like this one in Texas, or we like this one in Nebraska, or we like this one in Colorado, or we like this one in Florida. Would that have been going through the straight gate? You understand? Yes. Making the decision, enter into the straight gate. It's not our choice sometimes. You know, don't let the devil talk you out of what God told you. And you know just as well as you know your name when God told you something. When he told you to do something and you, you reason it out 56 different ways why it's not going to work, it don't matter why you think it's not going to work. That's what we were talking about at the very beginning where it said, trust in your own, don't try, lean to your own understanding. That's when it's time to trust in him. And you open that gate and you do what? You take a big giant leap and go through it and don't ever look back. Because all the things that you're wanting is through this gate. They're not back there. If we'd have stayed back there, we wouldn't have had all those cars. Do you understand that? And we never would have known it. We'd have been like all the people around us. We'd have thought this is just the way life is. Woe is me. And we'd have been praying to God every other day, give us a new car, God. And we'd have been fixing the transmission in the one we had. When God has given us so many new cars. But we had to do something. We had to step through that straight gate that he told us to step through. And it's not always fun when your flesh doesn't want to do it. It's not always fun to leave mama and daddy and brother and sister and friends and family and jobs and everything that you know that you're supposed to do and do what God tells you to do. But that's a straight gate. Would you call that a straight gate? I thought it was pretty straight at the time. I cried in the car for four days because we didn't have the money to pay for anything and we couldn't eat. That was pretty straight, wasn't it? Let's keep reading that verse. For wide is the gate... And broad is the way that leads to what? Destruction. Destruction. 
and many there be that go in there it. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads to life. life. And few there are that find it. Why is there few that find it though? Because they didn't get showed it? Because they didn't put that, they didn't want to do. Have you ever want, known you were supposed to do something and what? They didn't want to do it, got ahead of, they knew they were supposed to do it. And so they took the wide path instead of the narrow one. And that's not funny. But it's what causes people to have so many failures in their lives. And, and then they try to say, oh God, oh God, oh God. And God is all the time trying to say, you know, oh Mike, oh Mike, oh Mike. I said the narrow, the gate, go, go through the gate, come on. And he's trying his best. All I need you to do is get through that gate, get through that gate. Come on, get through the gate, get through the gate, get through the gate. And he is a shepherd. Is he not? Yes. He's not going to kick you through that gate. Amen. And he's not going to grab you and drag you through that gate. Amen. And he's not going to make you go through that gate. He's going to show it to you and say, come on now. And... And you, everybody in here raised their hand when they said, I knew I was supposed to do something and I didn't do it. We all did. I raised both my feet and my hands and every one of my little fingers and toes. Because we've all done it. Everybody has missed it. But by the end of the day, you're going to be glad you came. You're going to be glad you came. Okay. Um, Joshua 1.8. Now we got past that. Woo, say glory to, glory to God. Glory, glory to God. Okay, Joshua 1.8. The book of the law shall not depart of you out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do all that's written therein. For there's that word again. What's that word? Yeah. Then, for then thou shalt make thy way What? And for there's that word again. Yes. Then, then what? You'll have good success. Are there befores and afters yes. with God? If you do this, then you're going to have good success. If you do this, then you'll have prosperity. Is that the way it works? Okay, let's read another one. Um, Let's see, Genesis 39, 2 and 3 in the Amplified. I'm just going to read you a couple of these real quickly. You don't even have to turn to them. They'll put them up on the screen, but you may want to mark them. But the Lord was with Joseph, even though he was a slave, and was successful, a successful and prosperous man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master, and his master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord made all that he did to flourish and succeed in his hand. Why would that be? Because he then, he obeyed the Lord, and he put the Lord first. Right. I want to ask you a question, and I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but you know me, I'm just going to do it anyway. You remember well, several months ago, I taught on a Sunday morning, and I talked about us spending maybe three minutes with the Lord, and I had us to stop and do it. How many of you are still doing that? Maybe a fourth of the crowd. It's sad, but most people don't even have time to read their chapter every day much less meditate therein all day long. 
And that's not talking about reading your Bible all day long, but it's looking to the Lord for what you should do next. And it's looking to the Lord for how you should go. And it's stopping and thinking, Lord, okay, what's, what's my next thing I should do? But if you ask them what the name of the show is that's coming on tonight, what time? Who's the actors in it? What's their TV name? What's their real name? <laughs> they can tell you. And they can tell you every episode and what's ones they missed. Why? Because they've meditated on that. But meditating on that is not going to make their way prosperous and successful. If you put a scale up here and you weigh out which is done more, spending any time with the Lord or spending time with TVs or, or TVs or, or TVs or, or TVs or romance novels or TVs or books or TVs and the Lord. The Lord keeps going way, way, way down on the list. And about the only time there's anything from the Lord is, I need. Then he comes way up when things go bad. And that's not the way the Lord intended it. It's not the way his plan is. And he's not, he knows what we have to do. And he's not standing there with a whip of pray, read, meditate. That's not what he means. And that's not anything about it. It means your heart. It means where's your heart most of the time? Where's your focus in your life? What have you given your life to? Where is the, the focal point of your life? Is the focal point of your life your kids, your grandkids? Is the focal point of your life your job? Or is the focal point of your life your, your God? Is it, is it you're, giving, you're doing your job, but it's because of what you can do for your Lord when you do your job? Amen. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. At some point in our lives, we have to decide which it is. Okay, let's go on. Y'all didn't like that at all, but it's still the truth. <laughs> it's still the truth. Okay, I'm going to tell you now about this next part um, that I told you I would tell you what the Lord told me in the Greater Faith Conference. Um, I'm not against TV. Don't go out of here and say I'm against TV. But, you know, it, it needs its right place in our lives or it could be an idol. You know, I, I said it anyway. It's the truth. Um, I'm going to try to explain this the very best way I know how and uh, the way that the Lord gave it to me. I don't like to change things up. I made the guys change the board, bless their heart, after they did it, and they're just so good to me. Um, but what I saw was every person in life, every, it wasn't person, it was like every soul in life has a mission. And, and I don't know, and, and I've just been talking about TV shows, so I'm going to tell off on my own self, okay? That dumb show, Mission Impossible. Okay? It's kind of like this. If, I'll say it the best way I know how. If you are given a mission and you choose to accept the mission, mm -hmm. then you get to hear what the mission is. Yeah. Does that make sense to you? Yes. yes. That's the way it is with God. It's kind of like, that's the way he showed it to me. It's kind of like with him, I have a mission for you. Okay? So Cher is here. Okay, Cher, I had this mission for you. Do you choose to accept it? You don't know what it is. But you're going to accept it? You're going to accept it. Okay, then he gives it to you. That's what he showed me. 
If you choose to accept it, then he'll give it to you. So that's the way I perceived it. Then what do we do with that mission after he gives it to us? That's exactly what happened with us with the school thing. You know, come. We didn't know what our mission was. That's when our mission started is when we chose to go ahead and go there. Okay. So then I got this vision in my head. And instead of trying to explain you the vision, I had them, instead of you trying to dream it up, I had them to put it up here on the board. But I'll try to tell it to you the way it was. It was like, call it a road or a path or a direction or whatever. We start in that direction and it was going up. And we need to have any kind of equipment to do that mission. But there was nothing that was impossible. Everything was totally different. And everyone's mission was totally different. But no matter what the mission was or what the tool was or what the equipment was, it was there when you got ready to do the mission. That's what the Lord told me that night in the Greater Faith Conference. I just saw it. It just popped in my head that night while Keith was speaking. I had never thought of it before. And the Lord went on to tell me, everyone has a mission, and some will never find out what their mission is. And they'll never do it. And they'll never have the stuff that would be in their mission. He said, I have all the equipment that everyone needs for their mission. All you have to do is do the mission. Amen. Then I kind of saw it as he said it. And it's kind of weird, but here it goes. It was like, if you're trying to take a piece of land from the enemy and you need a tank, then believe me for a tank and you'll have a tank. It'll be there right when you need it. If there's a wall in the way you'll, and you need dynamite to get through the wall, there'll be dynamite there to blow through the wall. Believe me for it and it'll be there. If there's quicksand and a swampy land that you need to get over, there'll be a parasail as soon as you believe me for it to get over the quicksand. Whatever you need to both start and complete the mission, it's there for your use, your use, and your disposal. Get the mission done, whatever the need or cost is. There's no cost to you. Now, let me explain this to you. This came up to me right after that. Okay, in Branson, everything there is solid rock. There in our subdivision, we had to dig up and build a water line from house to house to house to house because something happened to it and we had to redo the water line there. So it took them weeks, I mean solid weeks to do. Were you a part of that, Rob? Um, it was Dave and Mike, and they were digging in ditches, and they were, oh, it was horrible. And they were blowing stuff up, and they were getting this stuff, and they were doing this stuff, and it was forever and eternity to do little bitty stretches of pieces of ground. Okay, so then we get here. And they were using everything you could think of, from dynamite to what all were they using? Those pick things to, uh, I don't know what all they were using, but it was horrible. Then we get here, and Dan and the guys were trying to lay sprinkler line out here in Sarasota. And I think it took them a half a day to lay 500 yards or something like that, because what is this? And they were half digging it with their hands. They had these little hand tools and hand shovels and stuff like that. Because why? Because it's sand here. So everybody's tools will not be the same. It just depends on what you're going to be doing in life. Everybody won't need the same thing. Everybody's mission will be different. So this is what I kind of put up here for you so that you could see. And this is the way kind of the, the Lord showed it to me. If, if you're going through life, this is going to make clear sense to you now. Uh, do I need to move up so this camera can see it real good or y'all got it real good? Give me a thumbs up if you got it real good. Okay. If you're going through life 
and you've got to go over this mountain range and you need an airplane to do it, what are you going to have if you believe him for it? An airplane. Don't let this be too simple because it's about to get complicated to you if you do. Then you get here to this quicksand. And the Lord showed me this today. That's where many people are in their life. They're in quicksand going down. And they don't know how to get out of it. He said, believe me to lift you up. All you need, this is really a hand glider, not a parasailer, but a hand glider that goes up and over the quicksand and gets you right over it with ease and no difficulty. Now, how long would it take you to get through this quicksand? A long time. But how long will it take you to get through over it with the parasail or hand glider or whatever? Very quickly. Same thing with this wall here. When you get to that wall, it could seem impassable. And you could stop there and say, there's absolutely no way to get through this wall. How many of you come up against a wall in your life? All you need is a sticker to a dynamite. You don't know what the dynamite is, but he knows what the dynamite is. And believe him for it, and he'll blow through it. And then you'll get to the end of your course, and you'll do what? You'll complete your course and go to heaven. But here's where the fun part comes in. This is where most people are. Brother Hagin said, and I, I don't want to misquote him, but most people never find their ministry or never find their course. They go through life and never even start their course. They come and go and never even begin it. I don't want to be one of those people. Do you? I want to find my course. I want to get on my course, and I want to stay on my course. You know, you can get on your course. You can start and get on your course, and you can get over the mountain. And as soon as you get over the mountain, something over here can distract you. Like, say, for instance, you decided that, let's see what we can pick out here. You decided you wanted to get married. And so you were on the course doing right for God. And you decided, okay, I want to get married. And what happens? You got off the course. You got married and you got off the course. Now let me ask you a question. Let me show you something else. You're now off God's course for you. You're a young married couple, and you're believing God for things. Is that hard? Is it hard starting out in marriage, believing for homes and lands and things? Uh, you're a young married couple, and you've got off the course. And say you're believing for something. Say you're wanting a house. Okay? Maybe it's not this nice of a house, but you're wanting a house, like what we talked about. It may be a $250,000 apartment. It may be a $150,000 apartment. It may be a whatever. I've seen it happen time and time again. I know of people that were going to buy people houses that were working with them, and they went off the course and went another way. And if they'd have stayed on the course doing what God told them to do, all they had to do was stay on the course just a little bit longer and they would have intersected that house. But they're over here on their knees crying and praying and begging God for this house when what did he say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. If they stay on this path, they're going to have to go right through this house. How do I know? I have yet to have to stand and believe God for a house. See how quiet it got? I started out in a trailer with no heat. My focus, Keith's focus, has been on putting the kingdom of God first. And along that way, 
supernaturally. If I stood up here and told you the stories about the first house we got, God put us in it, we sold it for double, above double what we paid for it. And he put us in it, and he paid for it, and it was supernatural. Supernatural. There's no way, in, and it started being built the day we made the decision to go to Ramah. Now, I could have sat over here on the side and cried and prayed for a house for 20 years. Or I could have got busy doing what God wanted me to do and even forgot about a house. And I wound up with a house with a swimming pool and a tennis court and six garages. If you saw the thing, you'd think it came out of the Hollywood Mansion movie star houses. I'm not kidding you. And we paid pennies for it because God did it for us. Then we continued going and we continued doing what God told us to do and we didn't get off track. And we continued going and stayed on the path and that's what, if you're doing you're following God's path. You do whatever you need to do and believe God to get over this. And yes, I'm not going to kid you. Sometimes it can be tough. And sometimes you have to stand to get over some of these things. But you continue to do it. And the things that you're believing for, maybe you're believing for a barn. It's there. But you've been standing for it for a long time. It's not off out here. It's right here on his path. It's right where he told you to be. But you're, you're believing for it off out here somewhere. Maybe you took even another road from this road. You know? You're still hunting. You're looking for God. You just keep getting... Yeah, yeah you even went back to the quicksand. <laughs> You understand what I'm saying? And you keep searching for your stuff instead of searching for God. The minute that you stay on this path and you continue searching for God, there's things that you're just going to intersect. If you, even if you're going to college and you get off at college and you think, you know what, I got college, I'm getting me a degree, I'm going to go off out here and I'm going to do my own thing and I'm going to, you know, just do whatever I want to do and I'm going to just, you know, be my own man. You should find your way back after you go to college to however you're supposed to get back to God. And serving God. Find you a way back to Him because when you do that, when you find your way back to God, then you're going to have, oh, you're going to like these things. You find your way back to God, then you're going to intersect things like these nice cars and this big old pile of money. Do you get the picture? People are off on the sidelines trying to pray and believe God for everything. They're believing God for their clothes. They're believing God for their trucks. They're believing God for their, their any kind of music equipment. They're believing God for the right church to go to. They're believing God for sound equipment. I mean, they, you can believe God for anything. They put a big old ship on here. I mean, you can believe God for anything. And you can stand, and you can cry, and you can beg, and you can pray. When all you have to do, the easiest and only thing, only thing you have to do is you have to get on this path. And you, a lot of times you don't even have to pray about it. All you have to do is get back on this path, find your road, get back with this parasailer here, and find your road and get back on this path here, and you're going to run right back into that car. 
And it may not be the car that you were believing for when you were 20 years old. But you get back on his path and you're going to get back into the good things that he has for you. I know it sounds simple. And I know it sounds like, well, yeah, but I think I'm on the path. Well, are you still having to cry and pray and beg for the things that you're believing for? Because we're not supposed to be having, I'm not saying you don't have to, to, that you can't pray and believe God for things, but I am saying that if you're having to stand for a hundred years to believe for things, you're missing the intersection somewhere. Because in God's path, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will what? Be added unto you. Let me tell you real quickly about, oh, don't let me leave this one out because somebody's believing for that. And here's some more even. There is jobs and, and believing for your kids. All these things are things people are believing for. For answers for jobs, answers for their kids. I mean, you'll just intersect them. You get in the right church. They'll tell you how to deal with things. Let me just tell you real briefly about the two other houses that we've dealt with. We moved to Branson. We didn't move to Branson to get a house. I had a nice house. I didn't want to leave it. <laughs> but we got to Branson, and I forgot about houses. Totally and completely. And I lived in a little three-bedroom house that probably had 1,800 square feet that was a rental house that the golf balls on Sunday afternoon shot through our patio door and busted it several times. Because I didn't care about houses. We cared about putting God first. And that was our priority, putting him first. And when you put him first, all these other things will be added to you. So in doing that, yes, I did look. I looked at houses. I looked at what Branson had, because I knew I wasn't going to stay in that rental house forever. And every Sunday afternoon when you tried to get a little bit of rest, there would come a golf ball hitting up against the side window. There would come another one hitting up against the side of the house. So I looked at this one house, and it was crazy expensive. I say crazy expensive. Crazy expensive. Do you know most people won't even look at houses that are out of their price range? It was crazy expensive. And they had a little brochure with it. And I didn't look at it anymore. I just set the brochure down by my chair. Well, probably six months later, the owner of the house called me. And he said, you looked at my house. And I said, yeah, I did. He said, would you buy it for this? I said, nope, can't buy it. I'm building a church. Dropped it. Three months later, he called me again. He did that, I bet you, a dozen times. To where he came down to almost a quarter to a half of the price of what he was asking for it in the beginning. And he paid the closing cost. And he paid everything else. We wound up with that house. It's, it was, at the time, I dare say, the nicest house in Branson. But I didn't look for that house. God brought that house to... I was spending night and day building a church. Do you understand that? Yes. When you put his things first, what's he going to do for you? Take care of your stuff. Then we came to Florida. We were working night and day on this one. I was trying to do the stuff in Branson. We were trying to do the stuff on this. I looked at a house just simply because it was so close to the church here. Everybody already knows where it is and what we paid for it. It was, in, it was in the newspaper. But anyway, I looked at it. And Keith walked through the door, and this is what he said. No, I don't like it. He didn't like the price. It's what he didn't like. So we walked out. 
This was at the beginning of us looking at the church. A year later. Now, I'm not going to stand up here and lie to you about this. A year later, we got an email to our office in Branson. And the person said, you looked at my house. <laughs> and said, we would like to sell it to you if you'd come and look at it again. We hear you're doing a church right there close to it. So I said to Keith, I said, what will it hurt just for us to go look again? He's like, Phil, that's way more than we want to spend. We don't even, you know, and, you know, but I prevailed. <laughs> no, the Lord dealt with him. I won't even take credit for that. And uh, we went and looked at it again. And um, I kid you not, for the price that they had it on the market for at the very beginning and what we got it for, it was a fourth to a half of what we first looked at it for. And that's not even the beginning of the story. The people that we bought it from, in the, between the time that we looked at it the first time and the time that we got it at the end, the lady got saved. And she went to a Bible study with her new pastor's wife, and she had our name on a little piece of paper. And it said, Keith and Phyllis Moore. And the lady said, the Bible study lady said, what do you have their name on that little piece of paper for? And she said, because I want them to buy my house. I like them. I like what they believe in, and I want them to have my house. And she said, well, let me show you this. And she said, this is what I had on my list. She pulled out her list, and she pulled out one of our ministry envelopes also and said, that's who we were going to pray for today in our Bible study. And she said, we've been a partner with them for so many years because he was one of our teachers. So a long story short, of course, we got the house. But before we got the house, she brought that whole Bible study ladies group down. They cleaned the house from top to bottom. They bought groceries. They put all new silverware in it. They put all new dishes in it. They put all new sheets on the bed. They put some new mattresses on the bed. They put new comforters on the bed. They left every stitch of furniture in the house. They left every curtain in the house, everything. I don't know of anything that they did not leave. All we did was leave the rental house, and like he said, I got my underwear and came over there. <laughs> Now, not only was it the blessing of getting the house and not having to pay all that for it, we wound up paying because of the quarters in the house and the barn where all the guys, we were renting two houses, that the guys that were working on this church were having to pay for the two rentals. We wound up paying way, way, extremely way less than we were paying for the two rental houses for us to stay there. And it was much safer because the guys were there when, with me staying by myself with Keith gone. Now, I didn't seek out that house. I dropped it. God had them to seek out us and laid that house right in my lap. Now, I'm not standing up here lying to you about this stuff. I'm telling you. When you put God's things first, I've had, I, I'm just going to spill my guts about it. I've had brand new Cadillacs. I've had brand new Jaguars. We've had almost every motorcycle that you can have. And people have given us a lot of stuff and things have been just a blessing. But it's because we're not out every day thinking about, you see what we're doing. My husband is in California. I haven't seen him for two weeks. You know the times that we've been without each other. You know the things that we've done where we've stayed up all night long and we've done things apart and we've done other things that our flesh is saying, you ever had wanted to do something and you know, whatever the saying is now, <laughs> didn't want to do it. You know what I'm talking about. There's something called our society today does not know what it is to put this flesh under. Mm -hmm. It's gratify the flesh at all cost. It's give this flesh whatever it wants, whenever it wants it, however it wants it, and stomp your foot till you get it. 
And that's not God. God is, seek me first and I'll give you your heart's desire on anything you can't even dream of. This house is above and beyond anything I could ever dream or wish or think of. And the one in Branson is the same way. It sits up on the highest hill in Branson and it overlooks the great big lake there in Branson. Now, I didn't give it to me. So you can write me letters, every one of them you want to write me. Because I didn't give it to me. I didn't do it. Hallelujah. And God will do the best. And you know me. I want you to have the very same thing. And that's why I'm up here sweating and spitting <laughs> and telling you this. Because it doesn't matter where you got off that road at or how far you got off of it, there's still time to get back on it. Amen. And you may not want that $250,000, $250 apartment you were believing for when you first got married. You may be ready to believe for the $350,000 house now or the $500,000 house or whatever it is. But get back on that road and start serving God and put His things first and everything you want is going to just fall right in your lap. But quit using every ounce of your faith to believe for things for you. Hallelujah. And the minute that you do that, God is going to give you above and beyond anything that you... I didn't believe for that yellow diamond. It just dropped right in my lap. I don't believe for clothes. I don't stand around and believe, okay, God, I need some clothes. I need some clothes bad. God, I need some clothes bad. I don't do that. Karen, bless her heart, she's one of my dearest and sweetest friends, and she's been working for us for over 20 years. And she'll say, Mrs. Moore, week of increase is coming up. Have you had time to go shopping and think about your clothes? She'll say things like that, and I'll say, Karen, I think about my clothes 10 minutes before I get on the platform. <laughs> and she knows it, and she laughs at me. But, you know, I just don't think about that stuff. And I should, maybe, when you look at me. <laughs> but the thing about it is, if, if you think about God's things, he'll take care of your things. Amen. He'll take care of your clothes. He'll take care of your, your life. He'll take care of your cars. He'll add, Keith has had so many motorcycles. And you know how, a lot of times how he gets them? People will give them to him or he'll give me the money. He'll say, Phil, I want one of them blue motorcycles. I'll say, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll check on that. The next thing he knows, it's sitting in the garage. Either I give it to him or the church has given it to him or somebody's given it to him. He's got it. Because he doesn't think about things. He doesn't sit around and mope around and say, I want me one of them, them new Corvettes. <laughs> he don't have time to think about it. He's going night and day. And when you realize that and you do that, God's just going to begin to dump things in your lap. You don't have time to think about yourself. You don't get up in the morning and the first thing you think about is what can I get for me today? The first thing you should think about is what can I do for God today? Amen. And God will think about what can I do for them today? Amen. That's the way it works. Let's read a couple of scriptures and we'll be ready to go. I think these will bless you. I think it'll help you to understand it. Let's see where we were. Um, Okay, I'm going to find my place here real quick. Okay, here we are, 2 Kings 18. NIV, verse 5. I think you'll get the picture. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord. Remember that verse, Proverbs, we started out with, trust in the Lord with all your heart? Okay. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Israel, uh, among all the kings of Judah, either before or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not cease to follow him. See what I'm talking about? 
He held fast to the Lord, to the path that the Lord directed him. And he didn't cease to follow him. And he kept his commandment, the commandments the Lord had given Moses. Now verse 7, read it with me. And the Lord was with him. And he was successful in whatever he undertook. Is it clear to you now? He was successful in whatever he undertook. Second Chronicles 26, verse 3 in the NIV. Uzzah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. And his mother's name was Jechaliah, and she was from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father uh, Amaziah had done. He sought God during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him to fear God, the fear of God. And the last part of that verse, read it with me. As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. Now, God gave me this illustration, and I'm going to leave it with you with this. Have you ever gotten a message, say, on your phone? We all carry a phone now, right? Yes. And you missed a call, and somebody left you a message on your phone, right? Mm -hmm. And it left you some direction. Your appointment has changed, or our dinner engagement has changed, or uh, I can't meet with you, or let's change the place we're going to have dinner, or anybody ever got those? Mm -hmm. Everybody in here got those? Yeah. Well, does it matter? If you listen to that message, if you meet up with that person or not, go back to what we said earlier. It matters if you listen to the message that you get, if you get the result that you're supposed to get. If you don't hear the message, and you don't do what the message says, you're never going to meet up with that person. Do you understand it? Yes. Amen. If they say, we're going to change it and meet at 8, you get there at 7 and they're not there and you just leave, well, it's because you didn't listen to the message. That's right. If God says, I want you to go to, to Tulsa to Bible school and you go to Texas to Bible school, does it matter? All the difference in the world. You got to listen to the message that God gives you in your heart, or that comes through ministers, or come, and make sure it, it makes a, a witness with your spirit. Don't just listen to anything everybody says. You'll go bells and whistles will go off inside you. You don't have to wonder. You don't have to question. I wonder if that was God. You know it was God. Just as well as you know your name, it was God. The good news is. It doesn't matter how far, if every one of these things were hooked together and you got on this path and you got off as soon as you got on it and uh, we had all these little things and, and they were here and you got off as soon as you got married and you went this way and you went this way and you took this and you went this way and you got it so far off you couldn't see the, the right way. Guess what? Same way you got off you still know beyond a shadow of a doubt in your heart what he told you to do. All you got to do is get, maybe it's here now, but get back on right where he told you to get. It'll still connect. Just find your way and get right back on. It's going to stick now, Tom. <laughs> That's because they're getting back on. I like that. Oh, but they're still on. They already got on. So can you say amen? Yeah. Did that make any sense to you? Yeah. Stand up on your feet with me.